Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Colleen. Thanks for being here tonight. Okay. You wake up in the morning, and you try to talk yourself into getting out of bed. You have to, because you have to go to work. You have kids to get off to school. You have responsibilities. You muster the energy to get dressed, go to work, but once you're there, you can't concentrate on anything that you're doing. You go to lunch with your friends, but you don't enjoy it. You're not connected or invested in the conversation. All you really want to do is go home, get in bed, and escape to sleep. You don't look forward to the weekends anymore. You stay inside on the most beautiful days because it just doesn't matter. You feel the overwhelming sadness take over, and you cry for no apparent reason at all. This describes just some of the struggles that a person with depression experiences. Everyone here has felt sadness, but depression is much more serious than sadness. According to the survey that you all completed, over 85% of you have either experienced depression or known somebody who has. I have known family members and friends who have suffered from depression throughout my life, and it's always been a topic of interest for me. I decided to research it in more, depth, more in depth to discover what causes it. I read many articles and also personal accounts in preparation for today. According to the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, over 16 million people over the age of 18 have experienced at least one major depressive episode in just this last year, which is about 7% of all adults in the United States. In addition, major depressive disorder is the leading cause of disability for people between the ages of 15 and 44 in the United States. Today, I'm gonna to focus on the biological causes, the signs and symptoms, as well as the main reasons why people fail to get treatment for their depression. There are many causes for, for major depressive disorder, but most people diagnosed have more than one risk factor, such as family history, stressors in life, or medical illness. Most people understand that there is a chemical imbalance in the brain that causes the disorder, but it's more complicated than that. Genetics can predispose some people to depression. In an article on Healthline titled, Is Depression Genetic? Written by Stephanie Farris and medically reviewed by Timothy J. Legg, PhD, in 2016, states that those with a family member who suffer from depression are up to five times more likely to have a depressive episode themselves. Ferris also states in her article that one particular gene may account for up to 40% of people with depression. The physical makeup of the brain and the deterioration of neurons, which are nerve cells, also play a major role. In a post titled Depression, a Scientific Approach by the National Alliance on Mental Illness states that people with chronic depressive disorders often have a smaller hippocampus which is a part of the brain that's responsible for emotions and memory. They claim that the longer a person is depressed, the smaller the hippocampus becomes, and that, quote, the cells and networks literally deteriorate. The Post goes on to claim that some antidepressants play a role in neurogenesis, which is the creation of new nerve cells, and it could be the reason why some of these medications are able to help. There are environmental triggers, such as stress, major life events, even ones that are planned, uh, or medical illnesses that can bring on a bout of depression. When the mind and body experiences stress, a complex reaction triggers the release of corticotropin-releasing hormone, or CRH, which in short stimulates the body's flight or, flight or fight response. According to a post titled, What Causes Depression on Harvard Health? People suffering from depression generally have elevated levels of the CRH. Prolonged elevation affects the parts of your brain that are responsible for the way your thoughts, behaviors, emotional responses, and involuntary actions are coordinated in your brain. Once this fight or flight response is, is closed, either by medication or electroconvulsive therapy, the depressive symptoms will begin to fade. Now that you know a little bit more about the biologic causes of depression, I want to tell you about the signs and symptoms. When I surveyed the class, many of you were able to list a lot of the common signs and symptoms of depression. However, it's important to note that there is a time requirement in order to diagnose it. The following signs and symptoms need to be present for at least two weeks in order to be diagnosed as clinical depression. Feelings of sadness and isolation, 
increased or decreased appetite or changes in weight, feeling overly tired or having insomnia, finding little or no joy in the things you once liked to do. These are the common signs and symptoms that you all listed in the survey. But according to the National Institute of Mental Health, there are some less commonly known symptoms of depression as well. These include memory loss, difficulty concentrating and making decisions, feeling guilty or helpless, unexplained aches and pains in your body or even digestive issues with no apparent cause and that don't go away, feeling empty, dark, or anxious, irritability, and suicidal ideation or even suicidal attempts. Many of these symptoms appear without apparent cause and alone do not necessarily equal depression, but multiple signs and symptoms that persist are the key to making the diagnosis and recognizing it in other people. So now that we understand both the biologic causes and some of the signs and symptoms, it's important to talk about why people fail to seek treatment for their depression. Despite experiencing these unpleasant symptoms, many people suffering from depression do not seek treatment. According to the National Institute of Mental Health, 35 to 60 percent of people with depression did not seek treatment of any kind. The remainder either sought medication, psychotherapy, or some combination of the two. There are several reasons for this, several main reasons for this. The first is cost. In an article titled, 15 Reasons Why People with Depression Don't Get Treatment by Arash Imam Zadeh in Psychology Today, nearly half, 48% of a sample of nearly 21,000 people reported that they could not afford the cost of treatment. About 18% responded that health insurance either didn't cover it or they didn't have enough health insurance to get treated. Imam Zadeh goes on to state that these responses are often based on assumptions rather than actual cost, citing that many generic medications are available for less than $10 per month and may also be free for those that qualify for Medicaid or Children's Health Insurance Program. Another main reason that people fail to seek treatment is the stigma surrounding mental health problems in general. Imam Zadeh states in his article that 6.5% of people don't want anyone to find out about their depression. Another 8% were concerned about the effects that it might have on their job. 10% were concerned with confidentiality. And another 11% were concerned with the opinions of their neighbors. So people are concerned with the judgment from others and, and the effect it might have on their lives or their jobs so they don't seek treatment. And the last main reason that people fail to seek treatment for their depression is because they think that they can handle it on their own. Imam Zadeh cites that nearly 9% of people don't think they need treatment, and over 22% thought that they could handle depression without treatment at all. While some cases of mild depression may resolve on their own with minor adjustments to behavior or diet, this is the exception and not the rule. I'd like to close by stressing that depression is a complicated disorder. There are various causes, both genetic and environmental, and we know how to recognize the signs and symptoms in ourselves and loved ones. We also know the reasons why people fail to get treatment. It's important to remember that people are often embarrassed about having a mental health problem, and they don't seek, seek, seek treatment for fear of being judged. Jeremy Divinity said in an article titled, Never Be Ashamed <coughs> of Seeking Help on the National Alliance of Mental Illness, that, quote, we don't want to be defined as weak or incompetent, or even worse, seen as unable to take care of ourselves. Whether we actually judge those with mental illness or not, those who suffer perceive the, the stigma which leads them to suffer in silence. Thank you.